Oh, over to you, Diana. Thank you, Joe. It's nice to be back and sorry I can't see you all. We were hoping for this to be a dinner uh, pre-COVID at the Conduit where we get to see all your faces. So um, we do what we can during these times, but it's great to be here and thank you to the Conduit for having us. Um, for those of you joining from the UK or the US, I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday weekend. Um, okay, so let's kick this off. I'll briefly introduce our panelists uh, and then we'll first turn it over to Rick um, to talk about what climate restoration is. Um, so Rick Parnell is the CEO of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. It's a foundation with a mission to bring atmospheric CO2 levels back down to pre-industrial levels, so around 300 parts per million. Previously, Rick spent about 20 years at the UN Foundation, United Nations Foundation, and prior to that in the President's Office at the University of Florida. So Rick, welcome. Uh, we also have with us Sir David King, who many of you from the UK probably will recognize. Uh, he's an emeritus professor in physical chemistry at the University of Cambridge and leads the Cambridge Center for Climate Repair. Sir David is a major UK thought leader and policy advisor on the causes and consequences of climate change. He was formerly the UK chief scientific advisor to Her Majesty's government and foreign secretary's special representative for climate change. So he has a lot of experience in government as well as academia. And he's still quite engaged actually today with the UK government and various representatives in the government on climate change. And then last but not least at all, thrilled to have really pioneer and impact investing space with us, Erica Karp, who's the founder and CEO of Cornerstone Capital. Many of the investors joining us, I'm sure you're familiar with her. Uh, Cornerstone, she created an, with a mission to increase flows of capital toward a more regenerative and inclusive global economy. And she, prior to launching Cornerstone, Erica was managing director and head of global sector research at UBS Investment Bank, where she also chaired the UBS Global Investment Review Committee. Uh, additionally, she served on the Environmental and Human Rights Committee of the UBS Group Executive Board, so was quite active on these issues inside UBS. She's also a founding member of SASB, which many of the investors on the call are probably familiar with, and sorry, a founding board member, and then serves as an advisor to multiple organizations, including the World Economic Forum, Omidyar, Harvard Business School Sustainability Programs, and many others. Thrilled to have our three panelists here. Uh, I think as Joe mentioned, and all of you are probably familiar already with how these conduit webinars go, we'll do a discussion amongst the panelists, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A from the audience. So please do type your questions into the Q&A and uh, we'll be monitoring those. So to kick it off, as this is a conversation about climate restoration, Rick, I'll turn it over to you first to define climate restoration and what the Foundation for Climate Restoration is working on and how to catalyze the actions needed to pull and store enough carbon out of the air to reach pre-industrial levels of CO2, hopefully in our lifetime. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Diana. Um, it's great to be here. I want to thank the Conduit team. Um, this has been a really exciting um, opportunity for us. Um, and I want to thank Diana, who I have known for about 20 years now, um, a leader in the field um, in climate, uh, for joining us and doing the moderating today. Um, and I want to thank Sir David uh, for joining us, uh, a leader in all fields. Uh, I'm sure we will hear more about climate and COVID and, and the intersection thereof. And to Erica, who has become a new friend and is a leader um, in the investment, impact investment, as Diana said. So thank you all for, for being here today and for joining us on this discussion about climate restoration, climate repair. So for us at the Foundation for Climate Restoration, um, we launched last summer at the United Nations during General Assembly, uh, September 15th of last year. Um, and quite simply, climate restoration is returning, as Diana said, is returning to the pre-industrial levels of 300 parts per million of carbon, um, which is where humanity has thrived for uh, thousands of years. Um, a lot of people have said to us that 300 is incredibly aggressive, but for us, it's very much about, um, as you may hear from Sir David, between 270 and 300 has been the place where humanity has evolved. And we believe in going back to the ultimate goal. 
So that's why we're very aggressive on 300 parts per million by the year 2050. When we talk about climate restoration, I want to just first say very clearly that um, we are absolutely 150% supportive of mitigation adaptation and all the work that's going on. It's critical. Renewable energy is here to stay. Um, there's no question. But the piece for us that's been missing is the simultaneous removing of carbon while um, achieving net zero by 2050. So mitigation adaptation combined with restoration is critically important, um, we believe, for the, the healthy, safe um, future of humanity. Now, when we say um, what exactly is the criteria, it's, it's pretty straightforward for us. It's, is it permanent? Um, is the solution that we're talking about, is it something that will last at least 100 years? Um, is it scalable? Is it something that can be, you know, literally scaled globally? And, and is it financeable? We cannot wait for governments to um, align. While that's critically important, we also need the private sector to move and make these investments in new technologies and new solutions. Um, so, Again, this is the third, our, our dear friend Kathleen Rogers, president of Earth Day Network, she coined this last year when she said, what you're doing is the third leg of the stool. It's critically important. Um, so let me just say, I'm going to jump to some very, we're all working from home, so don't make fun of my slides. They're, they're very basic, but uh, if we could put up the, the slides just real quickly. So, you know, very simply, this is um, represents two centuries of carbon release, or, you know, as I like to call it, uh, two centuries of geoengineering. On the next slide, um, we're going to go through a few solutions. Um, the next slide, you'll see the temporary carbon removal slide. This is the kinds of things that most of you have heard about, um, that carbon engineering, which is a partner of ours, Global Thermostat, who's a partner of ours, they're all working on things like um, jet fuel and, and soda drinks by removing carbon and basically recycling it. Um, helpful, but not permanent. Um, the next slide talks a little bit about ecosystem restoration. I think probably most of you heard about this. Next slide, there we go. Most of you heard about this um, through the Trillion Trees Initiative that was launched at Davos this past year. Um, there's soil management, some of the other kinds of solutions that are um, doing ecosystem restoration and natural solutions. The next side is emissions reductions. We're all committed to this. This is getting to net zero by 2050. Um, critically important and must continue. Next, we have the trusted two, more than two decades of uh, carbon offsets. The only issue for us with carbon offsets is it shifts the problem. It's not a permanent solution to the problem. So where does that leave us? Um, next slide. So even with all four of the solutions that we just walked through in the previous slides, 95% of the legacy carbon of the last two centuries will still be there if we reach net zero in 2050. So as you can see, that, that's the, the destructive carbon, that's the, the storms, that's everything that, that we hear about, but 95% of it, it's a real aha for me, having worked in climate for 20 years at the United Nations Foundation, the 95% um, of the legacy carbon will still be in the atmosphere if we do not tackle carbon removal uh, technologies um, now. So what are we, prom we are uh, promoting? This last slide, um, put very simply, um, removing carbon permanently with solutions that many of us have heard about um, through building materials, um, like such as um, uh, concrete ocean solutions, um, and making investments, as I'm sure you'll hear a little bit from America, but making investments in new areas of technology that have the ability to remove carbon um, simultaneous to the mitigation adaptation efforts that are ongoing. Now, let me just say that, that and then I'll, I'll turn it back to Diana, but let me just say all of this has to be done with testing. It has to be done with guardrails. There has to be policies, all of that, no question. But for us, the really simple is that we do believe that humanity can chew gum and walk at the same time. We can do mitigation, we can do adaptation, we will get to net, 20, net zero by 2050, but we also have to remove the carbon simultaneously. Thank you, Rick, for that overview. Great, well, perfect segue to turn it to Sir David, who can talk on so many topics um, previously and now even during COVID as he's, he's deep in, in the, the waves of how to come out of COVID and how governments and others should be acting. Um, but Sir David, to turn it over around 
the work you've done on looking at that 95% over the years, the centers that you're working on, on I think your goal is 350 parts per million to get atmospheric levels back down to. Talk a bit more to us about what you're doing and if you can address what Rick was talking about, some of those guardrails that are so critical, as we know, many carbon removal solutions can be quite dangerous. Thank you very much, Diana. And it's a real honor to be addressing the members of the Conduit Club. So let me very quickly run through some of the experiences I've had over the last 20 years. Chief Scientific Advisor, 2000 to 2008. This was a period when I took the job out of government from my very lovely position in Cambridge precisely because of climate change. That was really the focus of my attention. And fortunately, I had the ear of, uh, of Tony Blair and subsequently Gordon Brown. And basically, I ran a big program on the biggest risk to Britain from climate change, which is flooding. Flood risk for the United Kingdom, rising sea levels. When there are storms at sea, we have storms inland. Our rivers are flooding at the same time as we're getting coastal attack, which means that big cities like London are getting attacked from both sides. And I put out my report on this. It was about 120 people working for three years to produce that report. And the, the cabinet then asked me to report it myself to parliament, both houses of parliament, and that's what I did. We ended up with all party agreement, uh, the first and possibly only country to have all party agreement on climate change. That agreement is still in place. It's now Im Im embedded in a, an act of parliament. And under that agreement, we stated that uh, we, regardless of how negotiations were going, would try to set a model to the rest of the world. We would reduce our emissions by, we said, 80% by 2050. That has now been upped to net zero by 2050. We have a climate change committee of parliament, which again is a model which is now being imitated in uh, many of the Scandinavian countries, for example. Uh, and what that Climate Change Committee of Parliament is required to do is to set four-year budgets on carbon emissions from Britain. And the four yearly budgets are aiming to get us down to net zero by 2050. So this is a very well-ordered process and critically does not depend on the color of the government. We've had Labour, we've had coalition, we've had conservative governments, and all of them committed down this program. Now, at the same time, of course, we all recognized that whatever Britain did, since we were only 2% of global emissions, we're now less than 1%, uh, we were, were really subject to what other countries did. So we focused heavily, and I worked very closely with the Foreign Secretary and the Foreign Office, on establishing a strong negotiating position for Britain in the United Nations Framework Commission on Climate Change. And over that period of time, up to 2008, we had put in 165 full-time climate attaches in our embassies around the world, which meant that essentially every ambassador knew that this was a major commitment for, from the British government. Well, the negotiations in the UNFCCC took place between 1992 and 2015, twice a year before we got any agreement. This is an amazingly cumbersome, slow process. I was just two weeks ago talking to the president of the Maldives, who said, we've now got two generations of negotiators in the negotiations. The mothers of previous negotiators now have their daughters negotiating for the Maldives. So what we see is the process has become a kind of cultural thing, and I'm not suggesting this is a good way to go. 197 nations on average turning up with 20 people in their negotiating team. It's almost impossible. And what, I, what happened was I moved into the Foreign Office to uh, run the, the British negotiations. I moved during the period when Cameron and May were go uh, heads of government. And just to illustrate the, the all party agreement, uh, when I moved in there, Cameron created a budget. Uh, for, it was called the British International Climate Fund. And that fund, had 9.2 billion pounds in it. 
And we spent that money over a, a 10 year period, 2010 to 2020, in the negotiations. Now, how did we use that in the negotiations? It gave us a very strong, when it, I, I made 96 official country visits in two and a half years. This was negotiating bilaterally to persuade countries to come to that big meeting in Paris to, to reach an agreement. And I often met ministers of finance because they knew that I had rather deep pockets. And of course, with the developing countries, we used that money to help them to provide adaptation to climate change, but also to make the switch from fossil fuel technologies to fossil fuel free technologies. So by the time I arrived in Paris, I was pretty convinced we were going to get an agreement and we got it. And that agreement doesn't say we must keep the global temperatures to below two degrees centigrade. It says, if at all possible, we should not exceed 1.5 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. I'm going to take the credit for that because I was the one who switched the British government's position when I was uh, out in uh, uh, representing Britain at the meeting of the Pacific Islands Forum, the heads of government of all the Pacific Islands, who were really angry about the two degrees because they knew they would go underwater at that level. Now, I'm afraid the lessons that we've learned more recently is that even at today's level, 1.2 degrees, these islands are going to go underwater unless more action is taken. So we got that agreement in Paris. Uh, we also agreed on a review process. This is critically important in my line of story because we agreed that the nationally determined contributions, these were free contributions made by every country in Paris, would not add up to the 1.5 degrees target. So we put in place a review process. That review process was taking place over the last five years. This year, we come to the head of that process where we should match up what each country is doing with that 1.5 target. And I'm afraid to tell you that we're really a million miles away from matching that up. This, this year, uh, the meeting will take place, or it was intended would take place here in the UK, in Glasgow in November. But because of the COVID-19 crisis, we have shifted that. And it's now going to take place probably after August next year. So it's been delayed almost a year. And I'm going to tell you that I'm not too sad about that because we've got a bit more time on our hands in, here in the British government where we've got all these climate attaches, ambassadors working on the problem to try to get a major solution to what I perceive as a, a deadlock situation in the United Nations Framework Convention. And that is that we, we have the because it requires unanimity of all countries, one major country can easily block all progress. And I'm afraid to say that the United States has, since the present incumbent came in, been blocking every inch of progress in the meetings. And so as we arrive at that meeting in Glasgow, uh, we will have been blocked all the way until there is a change in the presidency in the United States, or if we do something else. And I'm not certainly relying on the change in the presidency as much as I hope it happens, if I may, if I may just say that. Um, it is that I'm working with colleagues around the world to see if we can create a global climate alliance of nations and states. And the global climate alliance of nations and states would be composed of countries that are willing to come together under the rubric that I've set, which is climate repair. Climate repair, climate restoration have very, very similar meanings. So the rubric climate repair means three things. One, we will reduce emissions deeply and rapidly. Emissions have to be reduced. We're emitting at 40 billion tons a year and rising year on year apart from the COVID-19 year. Number two, we need to remove greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere. Rick has told you about this. And we need to determine all of the technologies capable of doing this at scale. So 
we, we need to look at any technology that is capable of uh, removing a billion tons a year or more. And that is my criterion for a good, uh, good technology. And thirdly, we need to look at ways to refreeze the Arctic and the Antarctic and the Himalayas. And I, I'm just going to spend a few minutes to explain to you why that is so important. So the overall object, let me first of all say, is to reduce emissions close to zero as possible. We're never going to reach zero emissions. And let me quickly say, emissions of carbon dioxide are still rising, but not as fast as methane emissions are now rising. And methane emissions, anyone guessing would probably tell you uh, that will be leakage of methane from fracking. It will be leakage of methane from oil and gas recovery. Actually, the biggest methane emissions is from land use to create food. And the biggest emissions in creating food are from livestock. So we have livestock and rice heading that up. And because the global middle class is growing very rapidly, one billion spending nearly a hundred dollars a day in the year 2000 is now three and a half billion and that big rise means a much bigger demand for meat for dairy products and for rice and that is pushing methane emissions up we need to get carbon dioxide emissions down to zero and we then need to compensate for the methane emissions by capturing uh, uh, the emitted gases that are already there but also we need to remove net removal without emissions, net removal at about 30 to 40 billion tons a year in order to reduce the level in the atmosphere from, if you add carbon dioxide, 415 parts per million to methane, it comes to 500 parts per million today. That is a very, very dangerous level. We have to bring it down to 350 or less. So Rick and I are not too far apart on that objective. Now, in order to achieve this, I've set up a climate repair center here in Cambridge University. The climate repair center is aiming to achieve these three objectives, but of course not alone. Uh, we're creating as far as we can hubs of climate repair in universities, leading universities around the world. Uh, this is quite a job, of course. And we're also working on the uh, diplomacy and politics of creating this Global Climate Alliance of Nations and States. The Global Climate Alliance of Nations and States will need to be raising a fund equivalent to of the order in, I believe, 80 to 100 billion dollars a year. And this ought to be government money as well as philanthropic money or money coming in from the insurance and reinsurance sector, those who are interested in risk management in particular. Um, is this pie in the sky? I don't think so. So my, my closing comment is that when I was in the Foreign Office, and actually before, I began working on a simple project to raise the level of public funding in research, development and demonstration to deliver a set of technologies that would allow us to, to move completely into a zero carbon dioxide emission world. Um, at the moment, we're doing very well in terms of wind turbines, in terms of solar energy, etc. But there's a whole set of missing technologies. And what we tried to create was a fund of about $30 billion a year. And I'm happy to report that it, that was intended to be reached this year. It was agreed to by 22 countries in the world, including the United States, the European Union, Britain, and China and India, and a bunch of others. It, this year, it is spending $22 billion. The shortfall of $8 billion is the United States. But the uh, progress achieved in that is very good. Now, what I did was go around and persuade countries one after another to join that program, which is called Mission Innovation. And I'm hoping those 22 countries plus the European Union will also join the Global Climate Alliance of Nations under the rubric of climate repair. Now, I mentioned nations and states because 
the United States has a bunch of states that are declaring themselves willing for action on climate change, led by uh, the governor of California, uh, Newsom, and the governor of New York, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, now, I've been in touch with Newsom. I've, I've, be, I've had meetings in his office, um, and th he's very enthusiastic about this. I believe we might get 25 U.S. states supporting this, representing about 60% of the U.S. economy. Now, if we can get that group plus 22 nations include, uh, plus the European Union, I think we can solve the problem. That represents about 80% of the global economy. So I, I think that we can move without seeking global agreement of all nations. But we want to do that on the first day of COP26 in Glasgow, when the heads of government will be invited to be there. And we'll have a meeting outside the official meeting place under the heading climate repair and invite countries to make that commitment. I think I ought to stop at that point. Thank you very much for giving me the time. Thank you, Sir David. All that history is important and helpful. Uh, great, so following this thread and segueing in, Erica, Sir David's talked about mission innovation and some of these coalitions at scale to push solving these problems and challenges. So two questions for you. One, generally the trends that you're seeing within sustainability and some of these new technologies on carbon removal, but also are you and do you see other investors coordinating with government entities so that the work that Sir David is doing isn't happening over here while the work that investors are doing over there? You know, is it blended finance capital? Or are there other ways that you're seeing some of these conversations come together between government and investors? Um, so first of all, let me go back for a minute. Um, so David um, uh, can take credit for so many things. Uh, so we all should be thanking him deeply. Um, I want to tell you specifically what I give him credit for, which is a breakfast in Boston, probably about a decade ago, where he frankly scared the hell out of me in terms of what was go what's going on. Um, and I think that uh, I probably am still not as frightened as I should be, because it is unbelievable um, uh, how, how much of a um, a bifurcation there is in the investment community uh, from those like me who are super alarmed and feel enormous urgency and those who are kind of doing what they do. And the word sustainable, I don't care about sustainable, that's not enough. If we just sustain what we're doing, the status quo, we're all dead. Um, so in any case, we have to now really engage every, every investor in every region of the world. And the cool part is we can, and not only do we not have to go to public-private partnerships when it comes to the private um, investors, um, we don't have to because we're not gonna wait. Um, and so we can do impact and sustainable investing in such a way that we're not giving up returns, but we're making a big difference. Obviously the way we do that varies across asset classes. So anyway, let me go back a little further, but David, thank you for scaring the hell out of me years and years ago. Um, uh, to give you a little more context, so Cornerstone, my firm, um, uh, is the investment advisor for uh, foundations and families and some individuals. And it is uh, for the purpose of aligning their money um, and their values, um, uh, their ideals. But at the same time, it's not about ideology, all right? It's not about, um, uh, you know, hopes, and it's not about just aspirations. It's not about politics or divisiveness. It is about pragmatism and enhanced analytics. And when we talk about uh, environmental, social, and governance factors, that is a discipline. It's an analytical discipline. It's not a style. It's not an asset class. It's not, again, an aspiration. It's a discipline. And if you do ESG analysis, well, you can do any kind of investing you want. Call it values-based impact, double bottom line, triple bottom line, um, whatever you want to call it. But it's just investing. Um, so um, if I may, let me give you a couple of definitions just to kind of level set so we're all kind of thinking in the same place. 
um, sustainable investing in, uh, in, a, in a cornerstone definition is the systematic analysis of the most material environmental, social, and governance factors in any investment process. So that's kind of an umbrella term, sustainable investing. If we want to use the term impact investing, which I, I like too, impact investing adds the notion of intentionality. What do you want the impact, social impact to be? Second, um, uh, additionality, right? That's an aspiration, but for your investment, some outcome would not happen, some social good. So additionality is wonderful to go for in, uh, along the lines of you know, the intentionality. And then finally, measurability. We wanna be able to say, okay, here's what my investment did. And by the way, that's kind of a holy grail still. Cornerstone, we have our own version of an impact measurement framework. We use the idea of access, which I'll talk about later. But in any case, so those are some definitions that are helpful in terms of setting the ground rules. And by the way, when it comes to corporate sustainability, um, I think it is simply the same as corporate excellence. And we can define that as the relentless pursuit of material progress towards a more regenerative and inclusive global economy. All right, so that's corporate sustainability. So when we take all those together, it is helpful to have a roadmap as an investor of what you're gonna do, what is your process, what is your methodology, are you gonna stick with it? And again, that word intentionality is big. Um, so as an example, we work with, let's say there's a, um, a family or foundation that's totally committed to any of the ideas behind the sustainable development goals, the US SDGs, 17 of them, no poverty, no hunger, um, all those giant things. The SDGs, by the way, in and of themselves are uninvestable, all right? They're too big. So we come down to the level of thinking about access into among these SDGs. And so if we go to a family, and, and I'm getting to the, the story now, if we go to a family and a, or a foundation and they say that their whole, um, you know, their whole thing is if they're all about climate change. Can we advise them? Can we make their portfolio fossil fuel free and at the same time get them a competitive financial return? First of all, the answer is yes. But what's so interesting in that conversation, and, and by the way, we'll spend a lot of time with the foundation or whomever, we will create an investment policy statement with them and we'll do an asset allocation with them. Then we'll analyze the managers and allocate uh, the assets. But when we find that we're talking about climate change with family, you know, we end up talking about all the connections as well. And so we end up talking about climate and the disproportionate effect on women or people of color. And then we'll go back to climate, but then we'll start talking about consumption and the fact that we probably start, we need to think about circular design and the circular economy. And then we'll go back to climate and we'll start thinking about, oh, the nexus of climate and healthcare. Well, that's, you know, that's pretty big. And then we'll go back to climate, we'll start talking about infrastructure. And then they realize that that's pretty big, right? The reason I say this is because the complexity, the interrelationships, I mean, all roads go back to climate. And what kills me, and I'm not shy about saying that I have to apologize for the, the president of the United States. Actually, I have to apologize for the country to putting this person you know, where he is. But um, you know, if you take a really thoughtful uh, infrastructure uh, program, you know, a stimulus program, that's going to almost by nature uh, turn out to be helpful for the climate given the technology now versus the technology 30 years ago, right? So back, um, Diana, all the way to your question, do we need public-private partnerships? Yes. What I have seen, and again, this is not my huge experience, but what I've seen is the public-private partnerships seem to be a really good starting point for some initiatives 
that then become um, private funds uh, that grow private equity or venture or, or companies. So I've seen that a few times. I've seen it with, um, uh, I think one of the examples in circular economy is the closed loop fund with Ron Gonan. And I believe that started uh, with corporates and the public market and him, and now it's just funds. Um, there's a, um, uh, a platform called Full Cycle, and I believe that started as waste to energy um, a public-private partnership, and now it's a fund. And I think we've seen that in a number of other places. So yeah, I think it's great, got to have it. I think we have some wonderful examples in different cities. Philadelphia has great success, I believe, with the Naval Yard. So I wish we could have more of that. In this environment, it feels like in the private sector, uh, we have to do it ourselves. Um, so the bottom line is when we're working with investors, there is that bifurcation with those who really care and those who are for the status quo um, uh, with regard to impact and sustainable investing. I would tell you that I think that the, um, the trustees and the boards that sit on the endowments of many, um, uh, many big pools of money, whether it's pension money or education money, uh, I think those boards uh, need to wake up. I think they need to wake up quickly and embrace the idea of the systematic analysis of ESG factors. Um, so, so there's a lot of work to be done. I am very optimistic that we have the tools and we have the empirical evidence that we can do both purpose and profit. And what I'll tell you about this environment with COVID, um, first of all, there's a good deal of evidence uh, from uh, Morningstar and MSCI and Bloomberg ourselves. There's a good deal of evidence that funds that are integrating uh, ESG factors seem to be performing quite well, uh, even better than the markets right now, which is great. And further, I think we can say, I know we can say that ESG analysis um, is, is coming to the fore, at not as a nice to have, but as a must have. And so if we consider, you know, strong ESG um, metrics and measures, in particular, by the way, the governance piece. Governance is first among equals here. But if we consider good governance as a proxy for quality, proxy for innovation, a proxy for resilience, this is absolutely the time. We see it. You know, companies that are responding well and providing solutions in this environment, these are the kind of companies that are going to grow more. They're going to rebound better. They're going to show resilience. And again, they're more innovative. And hopefully, these companies also have a culture of trust. And that matters a lot for so many reasons. One, for you know, retaining and recruiting, but another for building loyalty in clients. And by the way, as a tiny example, um, if you take Shake Shack, which some of you know, the fact that Shake Shack applied and received for PPE uh, loans in this crisis is appalling, offensive, and I don't care if they returned it or not, their first instinct was to take it. So talk about like not having a loyal customer in anyone I talk to. That's an example of bad governance. Good governance means considering and addressing environmental and social issues. I'm sorry, I don't think I took a breath during that. So Diana, I'm gonna be quiet now. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. Uh, so I wanna move back to, in the time that I've met Rick, or not met Rick, but known Rick working on the Foundation for Climate Restoration and what he talked about where 95% of the legacy carbon, which many of you on this webinar already maybe knew, um, is actually the cause of climate change we're facing today. It seems that a lot of people are quite surprised as well when Rick, you say that to them. So how is the foundation, can you talk a little bit more about the partnerships you're building, the ecosystem where there seems to be even a lot more awareness around this issue that needs to happen um, before we move some of these bigger hurdles and bulldozers forward to tackle the solutions? Sure, thank you, Diana. And ecosystem is exactly um, uh, the right word um, how, as I think about it. I think, you know, the role of philanthropy in this, or at least what we believe our role in, 
this is to be the supporting player for the work that Sir David's doing and the work that Erica's doing. And by that, I mean it's, it's building both political pressure, it's, um, it's doing education, convening, advocacy, showing the opportunity. So we work across several um, different partnerships. We work with the UN because we think the member states are critical but the member states need you know, a little bit of fuel. And what we're finding is that fuel is the solutions and the can-do um, opportunity. You combine that with, we launched last, uh, late last year, we launched a campaign in Santa Clara County for local governments to become climate restoration governments. Now you tie that in with what Sir David's doing and with what Erica talks about with the infrastructure opportunity. So with Santa Clara being the first climate restoration community, they are now doing their, their city planning and their city budgeting requiring that you use carbon negative concrete, not just carbon neutral. So those kinds of different opportunities. Now we're taking that and um, bringing that globally through our partnerships with the UN because the member states have been saying that's something that we can do at the local level. So tying them together. We work with youth organizations because the youth voice is the strongest voice out there. Um, to have them understand, you know, th these are my over shorthands. It's not about burn down the banks. It's about change business as usual. So we try and work in, in the youth organizations to help them understand um, and, and convey the message. We work across faiths. So we believe, um, and we have a multi-faith partnership because it's my own belief that you want to be every single where. I used to work for Ted Turner and Ted Turner used to say, if you're gonna be in the club, you have to go to the meetings. And to me, being at the meetings is at all the convenings, it's at all the different groups coming together. And you know, if you're in the pews, you need to be hearing about climate restoration. If you're at school, you need to be hearing about climate restoration. If you're at work, you need to know that your employer is talking about climate restoration. Your local government officials should be talking about climate restoration. That it's, it doesn't get the job done just to do mitigation and adaptation. So we work across all of those. Um, that's reason that we launched at the United Nations last September is we wanted to really just make a big statement around the possibility here. So again, back to, to, as you said, Diana, building an ecosystem around the issues so that when Erica says there is real opportunity here, that we have a support case through our different partnerships for things like the Thunderbird um, School of Business report that talks about the three to $5 trillion business opportunity and climate restoration. So again, building, building the wave and building the network. Um, what, obviously, one of the reasons that we're, we're working with Sir David is both working at the state by state, the local level and the national level to pull governments together around the opportunity that's here. So again, um, we're, final piece is that uh, we're also working on a solutions exchange because what we continually hear is that the investors, as Eric has said, the investors are hungry for some of the um, investment opportunities and the entrepreneurs are not necessarily being connected with the investors. And so how do we work to bring them together um, and, and, and achieve full climate restoration by the year 2050? I'll stop there, but it, it, I see it, you know, I have everyone on the screen, I see it as that our job is to work across all these different fields to both make the messaging, the communications, the call, the advocacy, the citizen activism um, for climate restoration. Thank you, Rick. So I want to follow on on the solutions and actually we're close to time to move to the Q&A, but one of the questions in the Q&A was what I was going to ask Sir David anyway around solutions. So this is perfect. Um, so Sir David, the question is, good evening, first off. You mentioned guardrails for carbon removal. How do you get effective guardrails without a global agreement convention given that there will always be actors who don't follow the precautionary principle and we don't yet have any universally agreed governance. That, that is a very, very good question and a very big one. So let me answer it in this way. First of all, uh, when the European Union began leading the way on climate change, I'm going to say this is following Britain in 2005, the agreement was reached to create feed-in tariffs right across the, the European Union to encourage people to develop the alternative energy systems just coming into the market. It was very expensive, and so feed-in tariffs meant if you put up photovoltaics on your rooftop, any excess electricity you sold onto the grid, you sold at a much higher price than you would pay for electricity. 
Now the net result was, as the feed-in tariffs took off, the volume of the market began increasing really rapidly. And as a result of that, the price kept falling. It's a logarithmic fall in the price. It was not, not one economist predicted this would happen. So what we saw was, for example, with photovoltaics, electricity production per kilowatt hour actually dropped by a factor of 50 and it's still dropping. The result is that the market then pulls these products through. What we learned, and by the way, California joined in the feed-in tariffs as well. What we learned was that by 2015, more than 50% of all electricity production from new installations of power were from renewable energy sources for the whole world. And this is driven by the global marketplace because these energies were now cheaper to install, that's the first thing, than new fossil fuel installations. But secondly, it meant that those countries, uh, such as in Africa, with small villages spread over large areas, could install renewable energy systems into those villages without running large grids at enormous expense. The cost in Africa today of installing renewable energy into villages like this is now approximately one third of the cost of a standard electricity production system. So what I'm saying is the market delivers for those people who I think you described as laggards of some kind, those who were not playing the game. There is no room for the rest of us to sit back and wait for the last country to join the club before we start acting. That was the lesson the British government took on board in 2001. And I'm very proud of that because what, what we managed to say was, if we're going to negotiate a good agreement, we've got to set an example of what every country should be doing. We shouldn't negotiate from the point of view of saying, if you guys do this, we'll do that. Because the negotiations, always end up with less than you would hope for. Uh, I, let, me, let me just give you one example here. Um, when Schwarzenegger came in as governor of California, he held a meeting on climate change and I was invited to address the meeting on climate change. And I told them about the, actually at this point, the British government had committed itself to 60% reduction by 2050. At the end of the meeting, Schwarzenegger stood up and said, if the Brits can do 60%, we can do 80%. There, there was something competitive about what we were doing. I went back to Blair and told him what Schwarzenegger had said. And Blair said, in that case, we're going to do 80%. And that's really where our 80% figure came from. So, you know, we didn't want to lose our leadership position on climate change but we're very happy to have everybody else joining us in that leadership role. So I, I think, I hope that's answered the question. It is a very tough one, but we faced up to it right at that point in time. And I think every country should understand this. Do you see, just Sir David, to follow on that quickly, is there a possibility leading into COP then that um, some of these universally agreed commitments might be able to be made around carbon removal. So I think we all may agree the money is not the issue and many of these solutions, much of which are quite dangerous, could be deployed today in certain parts of the world, um, but shouldn't be. They do need to be tested first. Do you see that governments are aware of that and might come together to put some sort of an agreement in place? So Diana, can I separate out um, the, the switch from fossil fuel technologies to fossil fuel free technologies. I don't think there's any risk associated with that. And the risks I think you're referring to are greenhouse gas removal technologies. And right. a big part of the reason why we need universities around the world to work on this is to examine them in practice to create demonstrators in which we can test each of these technologies to see that there is no deleterious effect from the rollout of these technologies. There, a lot of um, uh, information has reached the media about the most extreme of the technologies that have been put forward. I, I wouldn't even look at those. We're looking at, in particular, technologies that imitate nature. And so, for example, 70% of the world's surface is ocean. 
and the ocean is now essentially close to being a desert in many parts of the ocean. There's not much living matter there. And a proposal has been put forward and we're now examining this in some detail together with bunches of researchers around the world to see if we can create a greening of the oceans, not the whole ocean, but maybe three or 4% of the world's oceans a year, where you create this greening, and you can do it quite easily, you get enormous shoals of fish, maybe three, four billion fish in one of these greening areas. You create an ocean forest with all of the living systems that go with it. Now, what that does is take up enormous amounts of carbon dioxide. I believe we can take up 20, 30 billion tons of carbon dioxide as long as there's no bad effect on that. And that's what we want to examine. Yeah. I see Erica there. See, this yes, is Erica, where, please. This is where stuff comes together so beautifully. Um, there's a venture capital firm called AIM, A-I-I-M Investors, and Shally Shanker is the founder. And it, what she does is systems thinking, which I think all great investors do, and in particular, she's got an oceans focus. But it's not that she just invests somehow here and there in the oceans. She looks at, at the intersection of you know, oceans and food production and transportation and energy. And again, all things for her to connect to the ocean. And so you know, we can invest in different ways in these solutions in a very pragmatic way. Great, thank you, Erica. No, that's great. I was just reading some of the questions here. It looks like there's a few I might combine together actually on the investment aspect. Um, effectively, if I, I hope I summarize these correctly for those who asked, but um, in terms of shifting private capital, they ask, can all the speakers or can any of the speakers speak to how we may shift private capital into climate resilience or climate restoration? Um, and also if there are you know, tools being used or investment products currently offered um, that may help with some of that, that shift, which Erica, you may know more, may, might not be specific to climate restoration, but generally around, around climate. Mm -hmm. Might turn to you, Erica, first, and then if Rick and Sir David, you have anything to add? So conveniently, we, we got to that question with an example. Again, that's a venture capital firm. We can do it with private equity firms. And by the way, we can do impact investing with public equities too. And some people think we cannot. I believe that you know, every investment has impact. Um, so on the public equity side, you know, whether or not you like kind of Amazon or Starbucks or JetBlue or Heathrow Airport, I mean, these entities have tried to become you know, carbon neutral or carbon negative. But um, with regard to, um, to moving capital and tools, um, I'll, I'll just give you a, an example of what Cornerstone uses. Now, by the way, when it comes to impact measurement, there's something called the Impact Measurement Project out there, for those of you who don't know. There are zillions of tools and frameworks for measuring impact. Um, the one that we use, we created around the idea of, I mentioned access before, because for instance, if you want access, I'm gonna use a different example, but if you want access to um, gender uh, equality or equity, well, you can't have access to that unless you give people access to education and healthcare and water and everything else. So there's the, the, you know, the interrelationships, the nuance. So we call it an access impact framework that we use to measure um, um, a portfolio of, of managers um, to see where you are, getting, um, you are getting the nuanced exposures, right? So uh, there's a lot of different frameworks out there we think about access. Um, you do have to be careful in terms of acknowledging the quality of the data uh, in ESG analyses and ratings and rankings. And, you know, so you have to be conscious that the quality of data is not there yet. But, um, but these data points in ESG are a starting point for really important inquiry uh, that leads you to whatever your framework is. 
So our uh, AIF, as we call it, that's our tool. That's great. Rickers or David, anything else on what you're seeing in terms of some private capital flows that are going into climate repair, climate restoration? Oops, Sir David, you're on mute. What, what I am, what I am stimulated to to remind people is what the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, has been saying. Uh, basically, he he it began in 2015 with his very stark warning that there will be another global debt crisis. He wasn't foreseeing the current COVID-19 epidemic. What he was foreseeing was banks continuing to invest in yesterday's technology. And what he meant by yesterday's technology was, of course, the fossil fuel technologies. And because he said climate change will be the big issue of the 21st century, it means that many of these companies will no longer exist. And all of those investments would create a very big debt into the future. So Mark Carney's warning, which he, he first gave at the Paris COP in 2015, he has reinforced time and again, and of course, having left the Bank of England, he's now joined the United Nations to, to work on uh, climate change. He, he is a, a, a very sane voice within the banking community, in my view. Thank you, Sir David. Oh, that's great. Okay, so moving on, just got, oh yeah, go ahead, please, Erica. No, I was just going to say, we all probably have some materials to, to share um, on this particular issue of the systemic financial risk um, that climate represents. We can get you a piece, I think we called it no place to hide. Um, and, you know, you look at the trillions in systemic risk from climate change. I'll make sure, Diana, to get you that mm -hmm. if you want to share it. Perfect. Yep, we'll get it over to Joe and, and share with the, the conduit members. That's great, Erica. Yeah, when, when, you, when you think about the report that came out um, that we launched at Davos, it's uh, I think it's one to three trillion dollars worth of actual economic opportunity for investment and an additional three to five trillion dollar knock on to your point, Erica, of avoiding risk. So it's you know, there's so much out there. Sorry, go ahead, Erica. Uh, Diana. A little more. I think we used. 15 or 17 trillion, so we're even more alone than you are. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask this question and I, I'm not sure if anyone has the answers. I hope someone may, but I, I think it's an interesting question around uh, litigation. Uh, so someone asks that the focus has been on government setting the pace and coming together to solve the problem. The panel does not seem to think that we should wait for governments to legislate and instead that states, cities, corporations should take action. Does the panel consider that climate litigation will play an important role in pushing states, corporations into taking action? Anyone on the gander on that one? Well, you have, um, you have uh, I think, New York State and the Exxon situation, you know, using the, the corruption laws to say that, you know, or knowledge of this, you know, of, of damage to the environment not being disclosed uh, is illegal. So I think we have some litigation going on there. Um, on the other side, I just want to uh, point out that sometimes companies are, they say, or their legal counsels say they are um, reluctant to disclose uh, information about what we would consider material environmental, social, and governance factors. And um, uh, like with some other things we see in terms of countries and states, there is a race to the top for companies who want to deliver on the promise of sustainability. But it's worth noting that despite companies saying they are reluctant to disclose, um, uh, Professor Bob Eccles, I believe he told me that there has never been a lawsuit, even in the US, um, against a company who has voluntarily disclosed an ESG factor. So that, that's kind of good news from a corporate disclosure uh, standpoint. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, go ahead, Sir David. You... 
I think I think I just want to make a, a slightly different point, which is we we all know there are many examples in history of major companies uh, unexpectedly coming into an end. There's the famous example of Kodak uh, developing digital photography themselves selling it off as something that would never match up to films and then being wiped out in that process. And I, I think the, the lesson here is so important for the 21st century. We've got so many companies still operating in a 20th century mode that cannot survive unless somehow they can learn how to make the transition themselves. They don't have the agility of smaller companies and it's that point that actually ends up wiping them out. So I, I think there has to be a critically important look at this because frankly, if all of those fossil fuel industries, for example, go bust at the same time, then Mark Carney's point becomes absolutely critical. The global economy will collapse. So I, I think, I mean, I, I personally would like to work with oil companies in helping them to make the transition to become clean energy companies. It really is worth working on uh, those areas because the potential harm of them all going bust is so, so great. Yeah, we like to say at the foundation, there are no enemies on this path. You know, I think to your point, Erica, with ESG and some of the other things that have been happening over the last 10 years, the old model of you know sitting in the boardroom or sitting in the C-suite and you want to you know destroy the environment if you're working in an oil company. I just don't buy that anymore. I think that you know they have grandchildren too, and they understand that this has to change. But you know you have a business model. So to your point, Sir David, how do you turn these behemoths around um, for a new kind of economy? So absolutely. Great. Okay. Last last question, and then Joe, I'll turn it back over to you to close. Eric and Rick, if there's anything you want to say on this before I turn it to Sir David, it's a question around COP26. Uh, it's conveners of COP26. Are you confident that the UK government has the vision, commitment, and organizational capacity to optimize the opportunity next year to move things forward, both overall and relating to climate restoration? So before Sir David shares his genius on COP26, because I, I know the genius is coming here, I just want to say I hope everyone will commit to, to restoring the climate. Go to our website, f4cr.org, and take the pledge. And all that means is that you're committed and you want to learn more, you want to hear more of what everyone, all of our different partnerships are doing. So just you know, join us on this mission of getting to full restoration. Thank you. So, so let, let me answer your question in this way. Um, the, the Prime Minister is committed to having a very positive outcome from COP26 next year. Um, I know that as a certainty. And, and as a matter of fact, the Prime Minister's family is a, an environmentally conscious family. Um, the second point is that the government has therefore set up a team of about 150 civil servants. It's not a small team working on the preparations for COP26. And the, the Secretary of State for Bays, a very big department, is the president for COP26. And this means we're kind of matching what happened in France, where a very senior member of government was the, the president of COP26. All of the signs are that the British government is taking this seriously. And I am happy to say that I am working with that team in the preparation for COP26. All right. Well, thank you. And I think everybody looks forward to hearing more from you, Sir David, on that as things come along. Um, so I actually, since we do have a minute, I want to ask one last question because it has lots of upvotes. Um, and Sir David's already talked a little bit about this, but Rick, maybe for you, um, a few people have asked, what are the perceived risks of carbon removal technologies? Yeah, I think that Sir David touched on it a little bit. That you, you hear some of the, um, the, the more explosive um, about technologies of, of putting chlorine gas into the air or 
can you overstimulate the oceans or you know things like that and, and again I go back to this is the whole point of the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge and other universities University of Hawaii is doing an amazing job as well that we have to be doing testing and you know I think that it is, is criminal to say do no harm by doing nothing than it is to to try and do experimentation with guardrails so you know, for me, I, I think it's it's more of um, urban legend. It's more of myth. It's more of legacy of people talking about um, things that have happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. That so let's do nothing. And and I just don't think that makes any sense. That, that's not a perfect answer to the question, but I think there's just a lot of of residue from um, bad messaging and bad reporting over the last 10 or 15 years. But Sir David's the expert here. on everything, but. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Sir David, anything else you wanna add in that? I know you've already addressed it. Oh, you're on mute again, sorry. I, I think I've already said my bit. I should have stayed on mute. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so in the last three minutes, which Joe also needs some of that time to close, but I wanna give our panelists any final quick remarks you might want to mention on this, and obviously, as Erica mentioned, we'll, we'll share quite a bit of information out um, on the work all three of our panelists are doing with everybody that's joined the webinar. Uh, but Erica, anything else you wanna close with? You know, um, yeah, what, what I would say, that I, I get, we get the question all the time, um, how is COVID related to climate change? And when I ask that question, people who are like seriously knowledgeable kind of pause and say like it's indirect and, you know, it's complicated. For me, I'm not the expert, but it seems like it is relatively easy to answer. And again, purely layman's terms. If we look at, you know, human diseases, 60% of those diseases come from animals. That's just how it is. And so if we have a situation, a climate crisis, um, where we are seeing habitats destroyed, and humans, by definition, having to get closer to animals, well, we're gonna have more disease. And here you go. And frankly, some people would argue that COVID-19 is, is frankly um, uh, just a warm up, as it were, to what's gonna happen here. So that is really scary to me. And then when I hear about like the melting of the permafrost, and who knows what's going to come out of that? Um, you know, these are things that really should make people alarmed. So for me, in my simple terms, climate and COVID-19 are entirely related. David, don't tell me how dumb that is, because, you know, it works for me in terms of getting people alarmed. So. Well, you started with Sir David alarming you in Boston and <laughs> ending with your own alarm. <laughs> it's good. No, we have a lot to get done. And I want to highlight you know, what I said at the beginning of much of this needs to happen in all of our lifetime on this call. Um, Sir David, any last points you want to add in? Well, I'm going to say I take a slightly different line on this from Erica's. I like Erica's point very much, but I, I believe the COVID-19 outbreak and the very bad handling of it in many of our countries is a, an indication of how good science has been ignored. Uh, we, we all understood 20 years ago how to handle a potential pandemic arising from a virus transmuting from an animal to a human, becoming a human to human virus. And we all knew what should be done. The name of the game is to get ahead of the virus spreading. And we all stopped it too late, except for a few countries like Greece, New Zealand, uh, with very, very few cases because they got in early. Exactly the same lesson for, for climate change. We're getting into it now very late, which is why my terminology changed from managing climate change to climate repair. We've, we've already done too much damage. And what I just want to end with, I mean, I'm going to try and scare Erica yet again, is the, the rate at which the ice is melting on the Arctic, in the Arctic region, means that now in the Arctic summer, more than half of the Arctic sea is exposed to sunlight. 
that blue sea absorbs sunlight very effectively, the ice reflects it back into space, and so the whole of the Arctic Circle region is now heating up at more than two and a half times the rate of the rest of the planet, which means the Greenland ice, which is sitting there in that part of the, in the Arctic Circle, is also beginning to melt and melt with a positive feedback, just as the loss of the Arctic sea ice had a positive feedback. If all of the Greenland ice melts, sea levels globally will rise by seven meters. And I'm afraid it looks as if that's on its way to happening right now. So I, I think this is why it's urgent that we look at climate restoration, climate repair, and start working now. There's no time like the present. Thank you, wonderful. And Rick, final word, and then Joe, I'll turn it over to you as Rick concludes. Well, I, I jumped the gun and did a little bit of the final of, I really hope people will take the pledge and want to learn more. Um, but I will say, um, and I don't want to be Pollyanna here, but um, the sense of urgency, I think the other thing that we have learned in the COVID is that people will move when asked, when they understand. I, I know there's a lot of squeaky wheels, but governments handle everything bad, lots and lots of there. But I think what you have seen demonstrated is that humanity will come together and move on something if they just understand and they're motivated and they understand the, the urgency. So I, I think there's some good news in this. That's it's a very twisted way to put it, but I think I think there are some lessons here that we need to, to replicate with mobilizing people to get on with full climate restoration and repair. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, Sir David, Erica, for taking the time and for everyone for tuning in. And Joe, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, really, for me, just a really big thank you to uh, Diana and Rick, Sir David and Erica for a great, thoughtful um, conversation. I think we have a lot of questions that we haven't managed to tackle, so I'll see if I can rummage up some answers um, from everybody and try and send that through um, with a bit of a follow-up tomorrow, including all of the different kind of resources um, that we've talked about, as well as the contact details for everybody. Um, I think it's just, you know, if you're interested in this topic and you want to find out more, please do reach out. I know Rick, Sir David and Erica would be really happy to delve into this and kind of share their, the opportunities, the challenges, the barriers in the way and the kind of general problems they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of pushing forward the, the agenda in this, in this space. So please do reach out. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and we look forward to seeing you at a Conduit event soon. So thank you everyone. Have a great evening or day, depending on where you're coming in from. Um, from the adventurous person who's dialing in from Australia, uh, hats off to you. Um, and I hope you have a good rest of your night's sleep, maybe. Um, but in any case, thank you all for joining and see you all very soon. Take care, everyone. <laughs>